Hey there, welcome to the Soul Bitcoin Show. My name is Kevin Devani, I founder of the Soul Connector. So I'm really looking forward uh, to my talk with Gigi. Um, after a long time, I haven't uh, had a talk with him, so I'm really excited because um, he he just recently actually uh, published his book in a book format or as a you know, e-book or, or paperback, 21 Lessons. It's available on Amazon. Um, and the subtitle is What I've Learned from Falling Down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. It's a really good, uh, well-written book. It's, it gives you a really playful insight and learning, you know, triggers the learning process, makes you curious and uh, makes you understand, you know, the essence and the question of why Bitcoin. So uh, I also want to, you know, talk with him about a uh, uh, spectrum of other questions such as, you know, is the market ready? Are people ready for uh, critical adoption? If, you know, if for unexpected reasons, for unforeseeable reasons, uh, the demand of Bitcoin in Bitcoin should rise, um, especially when it comes to the technological applications to the, you know, to the really uh, urgently necessary and required plug and play devices, uh, applications. Uh, I'm not talking about also like buying and selling, but like, you know, running your old full number, coin joining, coin mixing, uh, enhancing or strengthening your privacy, uh, all these things. Um, so I wish you know there was a little bit more competition. So it's going to come eventually, but I wanted you know have uh, Gigi's uh, position and perspective on that. Um, and is Bitcoin? Um, it's really something that needs to be uh, understood first uh, um, and and educated about. This is why I'm doing all these podcasts and videos. So anyway, if you have any questions, please uh, leave me a, uh, a comment or you can DM me on Twitter. My handle is Kevin Devani. If you want to leave me a positive review or subscribe, follow me, please, on YouTube, Twitter, uh, wherever, on any podcast platform, leave me a positive review. And if you have any questions, please get back to me. My email address is hello at the totalconnector.com or kd at kevandavani.com. All right, without further ado, this is my interview with Gigi. Gigi, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Show. How are you doing, man? I haven't hey. seen you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Kevin. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great too. It's still cold um, in Austria, so yeah, we can't change anything about the seasons, but we can do and do change something about you know how we interact, how we um, evolve. Uh, on Bitcoin, within Bitcoin. So why don't you just tell me, you know, out of the blue, what, what is like the most recent things that are, you know, um, that seem to be really important to you or that have, you know, uh, uh, crossed your path? Um, hmm, that's, a, that's a good question right, right from the start. <laughs> so, um, hmm. Well, the most important thing I think for the last uh, several weeks and months is uh, getting more into um, getting more into the lightning side of things. So I'm trying to catch up on the lightning network, and I've set up um, a couple of nodes and uh, played around with it a little bit. Um, but there's still so much to learn, and everything is evolving so quickly that I'm I'm having a hard time catching up really <laughs> so I, I i hope to to change that in in the uh, foreseeable future i really want to um yeah maybe even uh, program a little bit and uh, build a small lightning app something like that just a pet project to to get my hands dirty <laughs> all right um well did you uh, again uh, congratulations to your book um i i gave it to my girlfriend on january 11th uh, she was really happy as i said before she 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 told me afterwards she she was actually uh, gonna buy the book so it was sort of an intuition so i bought it for her and it's it's it step you know stylistically and and the way you know you you formatted it and uh you wrote it it, it just it's just brilliant you know it gives you uh, more of a playful, you know, uh, and, and uh, curious making uh, way, you know, that you, you go a little deeper into the uh, rab Bitcoin's rabbit hole. Um, so what was your feedback until now from, from other yeah. readers? So thanks, first of all. And um, I, 
um, yeah, the feedback was great so far. Um, so I decided to put the 21 lessons, which I wrote quite a while ago into a book form since it, it was just, um, yeah, very, a very natural thing for me to do. And I, I, I thought I, I would just go ahead and do, do the book thing, go through the process once and see what comes of it and see if, if people actually buy it. So the content is pretty much the same as uh, it is on 21lessons.com and uh, you, can, you can read the content uh, for free online, but if you want to get the book, you can do so as well. And, and um, there, there's a, a little bit of an, uh, like there's a, a little bit of new content and some corrections in the book and a very nice forward by Hasma Cook, a um, good friend of mine who was kind enough to write a forward. Mm. Uh, yeah. It's hilarious to pour it. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy that I actually uh, went through with it and, and mm -hmm. finished the book and uh, did the whole process once because I, 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 have, I still have some more things to say and I want to continue writing as best as I can and maybe, maybe I'll, I'll do another book in the future. But um, as you know, I, I'm going to be a dad very soon and uh, I, <laughs> I, I very much doubt that I, ha I will have the excess time to write as much as I did in the past. So we'll, we'll see how, how that goes. <laughs> who knows? Maybe you end up writing, you know, a children's book. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I mean, we already have a great... Uh, yeah, Bit and Robbie, rabbit, yeah. <laughs> so, um, Gigi, um, I've been thinking a lot, you know, lately, like, um, I know I've, I've avoided now, you know, the word mass adoption and Corey Clipson of Give Bitcoin also uses the term, it was sort of a simultaneous thing, but um, I use the, the terminology critical adoption rate. So, so it's more now about like getting like the, the minimum, um, you know, number of people into Bitcoin. And I know I'm a little bit obsessed with it and, and I have problems with that myself. Um, uh, whatever that critical adoption rate means, whether does it mean three percent, four percent, five percent of uh, you know each population of, or the, you know total Earth's population? Um, do you think things have become easier for people for really the average noob out there? Yeah, uh, well, it's definitely easier. I mean, uh, if you look back a couple of years, it was insanely hard to, to get up and running with Bitcoin and. Uh, Today, you can simply download an app on the App Store and um, it, it, for especially the onboarding on, on Lightning, for example, is uh, yeah, very much easier than, than it was a couple of years ago. So I, I think, I think um, denying that it got easier is just not truthful because it, it obviously got easier we still have a lot of work to do that's for sure and it's still complicated and it's still um i think hard for people to get into it and and actually grasp it and uh especially in the western world also many people don't see um the use of bitcoin except for um a speculative purpose and so if you're not into speculation uh, or not into finance then many people don't really see the point of it because um, more or less the more or less the financial system works for them and uh, I, I think those people that really get Bitcoin and are into it and and use it regularly are uh, people on on the edges and uh, people that actually experience financial censorship and actually have trouble getting a bank account or keeping a bank account or doing trans transactions and so in, in terms of mass adoption, uh, I think it's a, an interesting discussion to have um, what kind of percentage number is actually a critical mass. And I, I'm, I'm not sure actually where, where I stand on it, to be honest, because I think that mass adoption will come actually, um, even though I also tend to agree that it's not necessary for Bitcoin. A lot of people say, um, yeah, mass adoption, we, we will never really need it. Bitcoin will be there anyway. And that's true, of course. But I also have seen over the last 10, 15 years or so um, how quickly things can change thanks to technology. And 
if you look at the mobile sector, for example, or the computational sector in general, things changed very, very quickly. And I think um, for Bitcoin, it, the, the potential is definitely there that things change exponentially fast and suddenly a new app will come out or a new game or whatever social trend <laughs> um, will, yeah, will suddenly appear on the world stage and everyone will have this new app and uh, maybe it will use Bitcoin underneath, who knows? Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on what we're talking about. Um, like, um, if we're talking about like, um, you know, just a basic um, buying or selling of Bitcoin, sure, that's really easy, um, you know, and, uh, I guess handling, uh, taking care of your um, of your private keys, your hardware wallet, has become significantly easier. Uh, even though, from my own experience and and my own you know uh, interactions with other people, it's uh, we have we still have to go a long way. Um, what about like running a full node? What about coin joining? Um, enhancing privacy features functions. Um, for the sake of fungibility, um, like all these things, uh, um, do you see? Do you see uh, some some kind of horizon coming up? Like, uh, um, hmm. in terms of development, in terms of um, you know, sort of a Steve Job gimmick, like <laughs> <laughs> making it easy, easy, because uh, you know, um, I've, I've I've really looked at it, and 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 um, myself, I try to. I tried to play with Wasabi. Um, I, in all modesty, <laughs> I gotta say, I, I failed. Um, that's why, you know, I'm, I've been using Samurai in its whirlpool. It's definitely, as even Matt Mattodell of Tales of the Crypt admits it, it's it just, you know, not only much more, you know, it's, more, it's easier, but somehow from the privacy default functions, maybe it's not default by per se, but uh, you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. I um I mean I I definitely agree with you that it's still complicated and I actually uh, I remember watching your video I, I think you did a, a video on YouTube where you first um, used Wasabi and gave some feedback and I think some of the developers even uh, took took you up on the feedback mm. and, um, I I I realized that it's still very difficult. For, um, if you don't have deep knowledge about Bitcoin and also if you're not very technical, I think both uh, things are a hindrance to using those tools correctly. But it's just in general a very difficult concept like um, a key handling, uh, the, the proper handling of, of private keys and of information that you should not share with anyone is a really difficult and foreign concept. Like this concept didn't exist for humanity for yeah for the last several thousand years so it never existed before really and uh the handling of private keys and building like we we had this problem before in computation with pgp and uh building a web of trust and um the handling of your own keys and it's still a very very hard problem i i still think that we're um innovating in that and making it easier. For example, if you look at products like um, uh, what Casa is offering with yeah. multi-signature setups and uh, key rotation setups where you are able to lose one key and uh, they will replace it for you, so to speak, which is, you know, it's not as trustless as doing everything yourself, but it's still, it's still a, a quite a good setup and you need to make different well, yeah, compromises in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything is a trade-off in Bitcoin. Like, uh, you, you cannot have, if, if you want to be completely self-sovereign, then it's also possible for you to fuck everything up yourself and mm -hmm. do that all the time. Like, you can destroy your key, you can lose your key, you can um, have a stroke or an accident and uh, gain access, uh, lose access that way and uh, you have the inheritance problem. Like, there, there are a bunch of hard problems still to solve. And people are working on that. I think good solutions will pop up. Um, also, speaking of um, mass adoption, like your, your previous question, just, just always remember that um, this is not a sprint, like Bitcoin is a marathon. And in the end, uh, we're in it for the sound money and for reintroducing sound money to the world. And this is a, a war against the current system, so to speak. And it's, it, it will be a long game. I still 
think that it can happen way quicker than most people think because it's an exponential technology and my time horizon is, uh, I've, I've said this many times, like it's the, the next three halvings, um, so which will be nine years. And um, so I, I'm very bullish and optimistic for, for the next decade or so. And I think a lot, of peop a, a lot of people underestimate how quickly things can evolve. I mean, the smartphones are a little bit older than 10 years now. And uh, it's just mind blowing what, what happened in, in that space. And I think similar things can happen with Bitcoin and Lightning and higher, la higher layer technologies. I think the most important thing is that we don't fuck up Bitcoin because it has to be, well, it has to continue to work as it did work in the last 10 years. And I think everything else will follow from, from that. People will gain in confidence and uh, will allocate more capital to Bitcoin and Bitcoin will continue to eat up monetary value of other assets and of the traditional financial system. And um, I think the, the problems you mentioned with key handling, with running a node and doing coin join, I think those things they will, they will be solved eventually. And currently it's just very difficult. And if you look at other technologies, we had the same problems. Like with email, for example, encrypted email is so complicated. And so it, it basically does not exist because nobody's using it. Nobody's using encrypted email. But we now have Signal and WhatsApp and other encrypted messages. Um, I mean, I don't recommend using WhatsApp for obvious <laughs> Facebook-ish reasons. Mm -hmm. But Signal and some other messages are really good. and. Uh, the web is pretty much encrypted by default now. I mean, it still has a lot, a lot of problems and we have a centralization thanks to Google and Facebook and um, you know, mo mostly those two companies, Amazon as well. But um, it's, it's still compared to like 20 years ago where everything was plain text um, thanks to the re revelations of Snowden and, and some other people we now have HTTPS and encryption by default. And I, I can definitely see a future where we have similar improvements in the Bitcoin world. And you don't have to even think about running a node because the, the apps that you're using or the hardware you're using will just run a node for you. And um, the same for CoinJoin. I think with Lightning and other technologies, you will not have to think about um, handling the UTXOs yourself. You don't have to think about coin selection and coin joining. It's, it's very good this, that those things exist now and that people take their privacy seriously and use those tools and educate others to use those tools. But I'm, I'm more optimistic than most, I think. And I, I think that in the next 10 years or so, this will be almost a non-issue, just like encrypted web traffic is the default now. Everything has to use HTTPS pretty much and just spying on regular web traffic is, is not really feasible anymore. And I think just spying on regular transactions by re regular people will not be feasible in the future. I hope, mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question a bit. Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me take a short excursion before, uh, and then go back to my original question I had. Um, or, or in, in regards to, to everything you said, um, you posted something, you tweeted something about the facial recognition. I mean, it's a, uh, and that was like really uh, uh, scandalous. You know, the, the article that you posted on Twitter, it was something like three billion faces were somehow hijacked. From it. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that? What, what does it mean for the average person out there? Yeah, well, I think. I mean, it's related to the privacy issue. It's, it's not necessarily related to Bitcoin, but I think a lot of people in the Bitcoin space are very paranoid when it comes to privacy. And um, I'm not sure if I'm really paranoid, but I, um, I'm a privacy advocate for sure. And you, need, you need paranoia <laughs> for your job. A bit of paranoia, yeah. But I think... Um, I think what's really important nowadays is to have proper digital hygiene. And I think most people are really bad at doing that. So I'm trying my best to be um, at least not bad at it. And I try to uh, not share my real name and sh not share pictures of my face and stuff like that. Because I, I just know way too much about the technologies um, that are used today and have been used in the past to abuse all the data that is just put out there by people. And I, I think everyone has to find their own balance in a way. And um, 
have to, yeah, you, you, again, it's a trade-off. You have to decide for yourself what kind of information you're willing to share and um, do like a, a risk analysis of what might happen to you in the future if things go south and uh, yeah, what, <laughs> what, is, what is okay to share and whatnot. Let's put it that way. The New York Times article I shared, I, shared um, I mean, I wasn't really surprised that companies like this exist. Um, so th there is a, a private company that, is, that does large scale data mining on, um, yeah, on, on all the pictures that are online pretty much. And uh, they run sophisticated facial recognition algorithms to help law enforcement and other agencies uh, to find people and they are also yeah selling this to law enforcement so basically you can drag and drop uh, a picture of a person into this app and they will tell you this app will tell you everything about this person just by doing um, wow. facial recognition and, and a match of their database and they just cross-reference all the information they have on that and it's supposedly it works really really well i'm not surprised because a facial recognition uh, crossed into the superhuman level a couple of years ago. So computers are way better now at recognizing faces than uh, normal people. And um, so that's, yeah, that's just the world we're living in right now. And I, I think um, it's, it's good that stories like these are getting published and come to light. And um, I think people just should be informed. Wow, that's that's pretty scary, uh, Gigi. I mean, uh, I mean the abuse potential that I'm thinking of. Uh, you know, um, abusing this this kind of technology, or uh, like you know, uh, for whatever you know nefarious purposes, or, or uh, would it be criminals or um, the the sort of official uh, agencies or enforcement law enforcement agent? It's just yeah, it's just grotesque. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, you yeah. don't need you don't need a lot of imagination to see how um, something like that can be abused, and um, as we've also seen thanks to the Snowden revelations, these things are abused all the time. I mean, if you if you have such a system and are working on it, um, people are just people, and they will look up lovers and they will look up enemies and they will look up anyone they, they would like and they will try to get a benefit just uh, by abusing this data and if you yeah well i think the, the most scary thing is that everything is currently happening all at once and um there was also a couple of weeks ago uh, another article by the new york times about um, um very benign apps that uh, store your location data and they build very sophisticated location profiles uh, on everyone pretty much. So your weather app, for example, uh, pulls your location to give you better weather information and um, they sell this data to yeah, to the highest bidder pretty much. And there, there are analytics companies and companies that just build very detailed and specific profiles. And the, the thing is that um, if you if you look to China, for example, there you can see where this road leads to. Like, um, if you have a government that is keen on controlling its population and abusing this kind of data, then uh, yeah, you just have to look into the social credit score system of China to see how this can be abused. And I I I hope that everyone listening to this agrees that this, this is not the future we want to head towards. Oh my God. Because it's so, you know, it, it's so realistic that this could happen. You know, I see, I, I'm just observing everything that's going on right now. And that's why I asked you, the reason I'm asking, uh, you know, um, um, why, what do you think about critical adoption is because I see these unexpected, you know, uh, terrible events taking place, uh, such as, you know, limiting cash, banning of cash, uh, this, you know, the centralized, the central bank digital currencies coming in. Uh, negative interest rates are already in 25, 30% of all bank accounts, deposit accounts in, in, in Germany. You know, the, the pending ca crash that could happen anytime soon, maybe latest of 2021 uh, in Germany, the meltdown, you know, of the banks, of the, you know, the insolvencies. So there, so there are conditions that could happen unexpectedly sooner than anticipated. And then people are, will literally, 
you know, flock to Bitcoin, right? They, they will, you know, uh, try it, you know, to, to, to look for the exit door, like safe haven asset or whatever, like, like capital control, um, all these things. So how do you, you know, how do you, how would we manage that if there's not more competition than, for example, you mentioned Casa. Yeah, you know, even Hess McCook admitted he's not technical much either, but he, he prefers Casa because not only of its ecosystem, it's really plug and play easy. And I'm just wondering why isn't there more competition for, you know, delivering the all in one kit to people? <laughs> um, I think there is some competition. I just think that um, the space is still rather small. I think the, the Bitcoin space in, in particular is uh, rather small. We saw in 2017, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the Scambrian explosion of, of shit coins and just a huge misallocation of capital and developer time into other projects. And I think Bitcoin, the Bitcoin ecosystem would be further along if, um, we wouldn't have had this um, misallocation. And I, I think to, to stay on a positive note, I think um, in the last, yeah, in the last year or maybe one or two years, I think we saw a reallocation uh, of human capital and uh, just capital in general to Bitcoin only in, 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 in the most general sense, I would say. And I think that's a good development. So I think the, more competition will come. I think more more products will come. Um, I I think just people in the Bitcoin space underestimate how early we still are. Um, it, the, the space again is still very very small in my opinion, and you can see this also in terms of market capitalization and um, just comparing it to other safe haven assets and to other. Um, yeah, just the, the amount of money that is in other areas compared to Bitcoin and the wider ecosystem. Um, it's it's just, there is no comparison yet. Uh, we're, we're still very, very small. It's still a very, very small lifeboat. And um, I'm not convinced that if the next crash will come that everyone will flock to Bitcoin. I think a lot of Bitcoin, I would like to think that, but um, I think most people still are very much intimidated by Bitcoin because they just don't understand it at all. And um, I think a lot of people are still kind of afraid because, um, yeah, if, if you think about Bitcoin, I think a lot of people automatically think of uh, hacks and uh, just exchanges going bust and people losing money and people losing access to the Bitcoin. So um, I think, yeah, we just need a little bit more time and I'm, I'm not sure if um, Bitcoin as a whole or let's say the Bitcoin space as a whole would be ready uh, if the crash would occur like this year or the next one. I, I, I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, depends who you're talking to, I guess. Um, I mean, at least I'm proud to have made my, my girlfriend and her brother to a Bitcoiner. <laughs> And you know what's so funny? It's 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 always you know the same observation. It's that what I observe, I mean, generally is also is that once it's you know once it there is more or less a positive review or an article or some kind of media coverage on the mainstream, right? On mainstream coverage, whether it be you know a small district uh, <laughs> newspaper or something like that, <laughs> then all of a sudden, oh yeah, so it must be something good, must be something valid. So we got to accept it. Like like this is like the the condition uh, the the brain that's been conditioned, I think, you know, if it's on, I don't know, OAF, Austria's, you know, television or mainstream uh, <laughs> newspaper, then we got to, you know, we somehow got to deal with it, right? Because it's it's on mainstream. So this is, I mean, it's a little bit, yeah, it's it's a sad, that's a sad part of it because there's so much uh, information, so much knowledge. There's your book, there's your, you know, you've got a bunch of podcasters and, and, and YouTube videos and really, um, uh, and now even people, you know, from Bayern Landesbank, uh, like mainstream institutions, this is like, this is something that, where it makes an effect because, uh, you know, it has sort of a respectability, it, people look up to that, you know, it's mainstream institutions, it's established institutions. So I guess the more, um, you know, um, elaborations and discussions coming out of these institutions, um, um, the more generally accepted uh, it becomes then. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Um, I think, well, I think what you're doing is exactly the right thing to do. Like onboard the people that are closest to you and uh, try to save them in a way. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I I don't necessarily want to speak in absolutist terms, um, but uh, of course it's it it is kind of a safe haven and a lifeboat if you, um, well if you if you use it as as such. Like if you're afraid of the financial uh, collapse, then the best thing to do is stack as many sets as you can, take care of your keys, and just dollar cost average every week or every day or every month, whatever you can um, set up and whatever you can afford and just, yeah, wait it out, wait for the storm, so to speak. But I think I, I really like the phrase that Bitcoin is different things to different people. And for, for us in the, in the West, it, it might be like a savings vehicle. And for other people, they, they might use it very differently and uh, just use it to wire money home, for example. And I... Um, I think I think it it will continue to evolve like that. That uh, just uh, a lot of Bitcoiners try to onboard as many close friends and family as they possibly can themselves, because that's just what even uh, yeah <laughs> evangelical believers do. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm also happy, as as you said, the, um, the Bayern Landesbank, they did a, a proper analysis of the stock to flow model, I believe. And um, they, um, I, I think I saw a presentation of, of one of the Bayern LB people at the value of uh, Bitcoin conference. Bitcoin, yeah, I'm going to actually have an interview both with both of them, Manuel Anders and um, Jörg Hermsdorf. Um, nice. Who did that together? Yeah, it would be, I mean, we're going to do this in German for you know also f maybe for the audience. Yeah, so let's yeah, see. That's nice, that's good to hear. And I, I think I think it will just evolve in parallel because now the uh, I mean we have some Bitcoiners at the banks now, and we have some Bitcoiners even in Congress and in the House of Representatives in the U.S. And it will just be it, it will just be a matter of time until. Um, every political party has um, some Bitcoiners because they got personally interested in it and are just well read in it and understand the system properly. And I think we, we start to see that now with, uh, for example, the Bayern LB people. And I'm, um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, all the major banks had some people that are really seriously looking into that. And I share the concern of, of some of the Bitcoiners that um, it will be a race uh, in, in, in that sense that um, the little man might be outrun by the current institutions because I think the banks will start to stack as well and will allocate uh, some of, of their money into Bitcoin. And I think that's, that's when the, the block space will really run out because, um, yeah, Bitcoin is very scarce. And I think... The, the time to stack sets in peace, it, it will run out uh, at some point in the future. Wow, wow. Oh, that's a, that's a pretty, <laughs> pretty interesting statement you, you do. Yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, I mean, how many people can stack sets regularly on the base chain? It's not, it's not many, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's really not many because if, if you just do the math, um, block, block space is very, very scarce. And mm -hmm. uh, you would have to resort to second layer solutions if uh, things really take off. And then you, I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that those solutions will pop up in the future. But um, in, in general, I believe that um, if, if you're just a, a regular person working a regular job, you just wouldn't be, you probably wouldn't be able to, um, to pay the transaction fees if you stack daily or weekly or something like that. I mean, it's we, we've seen it before. We will see it again. Fees will rise, and uh, it's there's just yeah, <laughs> there's just mm. no way around that. Mm. Do you, are you talking about like an exponential fee rise or just you know a gradual like? Um... Uh, well, who knows? It's a fee market, you know. So uh, mm. fees will rise as high as people are willing to pay for it, and um, so there's not really a way to tell. Uh, I, I would say I'm, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we we have a lot of prot protocol improvements in the works, and I'm very bullish on Lightning. I think that um, 
like we've seen uh, even last year. I mean, <laughs> the, the new year is very young still, but um, a couple of weeks ago, we saw the first exchanges um, also hopping onto Lightning and um, enabli enabling Lightning also for, for traders and to get your money into Bitcoin uh, using the Lightning network in that way. And I'm just in general very bullish that all this will be sorted out by the market and um, speaking of, of fees i mean we re, we regularly see very large transactions that pretty much move like a billion dollars without having any fee at all like um only i think a week ago or so a billion dollars was moved for a fee of i don't know maybe it was like 75 cents or maybe yes. ten dollars I, I i don't care. I mean, it's <laughs> incredible nine, you know? yeah and i think you you obviously can see the the power of bitcoin there and if, if you're a, a large institution and you're utilizing Bitcoin in that way, then you're, of course, willing to pay way, way, way more than the average user would be willing to pay just to stack sets. And I think we will, all, all of this will be happening in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this, um, this is, uh, I don't know what to call it. I mean, is, could this be like a unexpected, I don't know whether it's the right terminology or uh, from, um, Nassim Taleb, uh, the black swan event, like something that is really unexpected, like events going to, to accelerate, you know, in speed and, and, and things are going to happen so unexpectedly fast um, and so unforeseeable that it's really going to hit us, uh, hit everybody, to, in, you know. Um, do, do you think this is going to happen in the next few years? Like market liquidity, market capitalization, uh, the, the demand rising exponentially is this realistic <laughs> i think i think bitcoin was the black swan event um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i think i think the most important thing i mean in general the most important thing was um that bitcoin was was created in the first place that it came into being but from a market perspective i think the most important event was um the first monetization of bitcoin that someone was willing to um, pay something for uh, the first few bitcoins like the first exchange that was done for monetary value i think that was the most important step for bitcoin and after that it's just a, a feedback loop and i think every single satoshi will just rise in value because of this feedback loop it will it will just take a little bit of time but again i think <laughs> we're still on an exponential trend and it's still an exponential process and we will we will have um these these cycles i'm quite convinced that that these cycles will continue and we will have the next insane mania and insane bull run and we will again have a, a, a blow off from the top and we will have another um, bear cycle and people will lose like 95 to 99 percent of the money and that's just the way it seems that this this organic system wants to grow and mm. i think there is not much we can do about it speaking of other black swan events i i, I mean there are black swan events they are impossible to forecast so it's impossible to tell but if the macro guys are to believe i um yeah, I think we're overdue for an, another financial crisis and another mm -hmm. crash. And um, I think it's it's hard to say how this will play out. It, it, it will probably be different than the great financial crisis of 2008, but who knows? I mean- Yeah, that was peanuts. Yeah, 2008 was peanuts, I think, compared to what is coming with all the, yeah, with all the negative rate interest policies, the credit uh, debt bubble, and, I think what makes the current climate so interesting is that Bitcoin in itself, like even if the current financial system would be working perfectly, it would still have its merit and would be working as it is working right now and people would still use it. And <laughs> and yeah. we have now this, this um, additional uh, variable that the current financial system is kind of going to shit. And as you said, we have negative interest rate policy and we have all kinds of really weird, insane things happening and uh, a lot of liquidity is injected into the system and we still have quantitative easing even though it's not called that anymore. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's gonna be interesting how, how the old and the new financial system 
um, how how the interplay is gonna be because I think it's not it's not out of the question that um, some of the big financial players uh, will get into Bitcoin in, in before or during the next crash or after the next crash and then things will be really different I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally with you on that. Uh, you um, let me ask you just uh, to wrap this up a little. Um, why is there only get better for auto DC for an auto? What do you call it? Because it's a favorite thing of uh, Has McCook auto uh, dollar cost averaging. There's only one company right in Europe that that does that, or is are there more? Is there more competition? Um, I only know of this one company and. Um, why there is not more competition? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, this. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this makes me wonder. You know, on every level, you know, whether it's be auto DCA or, uh, you know, people coming together, entrepreneurs coming together, investors. I actually talked to investors, and they they said, you know, let's do this. You know, I said, yeah, but you know, I mean, I'm not a techie. I would we would have to set up a you know a really excellent team to uh, do some product development. You know, uh, sort of a you know a really healthy competition to uh, uh, and and create uh, all in one kit. That would that would be something I see in the very foreseeable future. Um, do you think it's something doable? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's definitely doable. I but but it's uh, why is there not more competition? I think it's still a, a, a difficult space to start companies in. I think, uh, for example, we saw. As we saw with um, uh, Bottle Pay, that they had mm -hmm. to close down yeah, because of the uh, AML5 uh -huh. regulations. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that there are many countries that just uh, have no clear regulation or are, have already over regulated everything that has to do with Bitcoin. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs are just a little bit cautious to start full on Bitcoin companies um, because of regulatory backlash and um, yeah I mean you don't want to get into the weeds of uh, taxation for example if you if you are um, for example taking your profits in Bitcoin or paying your employees in Bitcoin or whatever mm -hmm. and uh, it's just different in every country so it's really hard I think to do um, yeah uh, companies that act globally and Bitcoin is uh, borderless technology so everything you do it makes sense that you also do globally in a way and uh, yeah I, I think <laughs> I think it will just take time and I think it will um, yeah take a lot of education for politicians and, and regulators as well and I think um, yeah it will also take time until um, yeah venture capitalists and other people um, lose their fear in a, in in some sense of Bitcoin and um, again I'm I'm hopeful but I I also think that um, uh, yeah I, I know I repeat myself but <laughs> I I think everything is is still kind of small and you can't save everyone um, and you can't save everyone right now and you you, you never can save everyone <laughs> uh, but Bitcoin won't go away and so. The best thing to do is, as I said, the, the stuff that you're doing. Educate uh, your loved ones, educate your friends, try to get them at, at least a little bit of exposure into Bitcoin. You never know when you need it. And yeah, you never know when shit really hits the fan. <laughs> Good. Well, um, I really enjoyed this talk. Um, really awesome. Can you, uh, do you want to, like, do you have any final thoughts? It's something we should have mentioned. Um, um, yeah. For mentioning your, your your articles and your website, <laughs> I mm -hmm. think um, no, I think I'm good. I think uh, again, I I just want to stress that that um, for all the Bitcoiners that might be listening, um, just um, remember that this is not a sprint, but it's a marathon, and uh, we need to have a lot of patience and a, a lot of good virtues and um, just. Yeah, try try to, to try to be patient with 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 your friends and your family, and try to be patient with yourself, and just try to uh, talk to everyone honestly and educate everyone as as well as you can, and take everything step by step. Like, not everyone has to be a, a full on self sovereign cypherpunk uh, that loses his identity and <laughs> does perfect opsec all the time. Um, it, it, it's a step-by-step -step, uh, gradual process and I think it's also necessary for, 
to for Bitcoin to be used correctly, you also have to understand it quite a bit, and um, so it just takes time and and some patience. Right. So yeah, at the end of the day, you know, we're all doing this, you know, for our future and for for all children and for your child. <laughs> so I'm really excited and happy for you, um, Gigi, that you know you're becoming dad in two months, Thanks. right? So yeah. 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 <laughs> So hope to yeah hope to see you soon man and uh, sometime in Austria and yeah let's make the best yeah, out of it. I'll be around. I'll be at some conferences. Un unfortunately, I can't uh, come to the San Francisco Bitcoin Twenty Twenty conference. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of sad about it, but you know, uh, I, I, <laughs> it, it will be the week when when my child is born. So um, I, there's just no way I'm gonna make that. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll also be at the uh, um, Value of Bitcoin conference in Munich, I think, and. I think I'll be there as well. So, so. Uh, are you going to be in Vienna? Because there's going to be on March 5th, the Value Bitcoin Conference, sort of a satellite uh, conference of the Value Bitcoin Conference in, um, in Vienna on yeah, March 5th. I, I, I'm not sure if I can make it, maybe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll see you around anyway. <laughs> I'll see you around, Jake. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. So, what do you guys think about this amazing interview talk with Gigi? Um, give him a follow on uh, Twitter. His handle is at their Gigi, or maybe I'm even Prati. <laughs> I always call him Gigi, so maybe it's uh, Gigi, the, um, sort of as his pseudonymous name. And check out his website, theirgigi.com. Also, Bitcoin um, minus resources.com. And then we've got another website, 21lessons.com. There you can see also the, the cover of his book. And you can even, you know, uh, listen to it as an, I think, I even believe in a, as an audio. So it's definitely available on, if you click on it, you, you'll come to Amazon where you can order it. Definitely order it. It's really worth having it in your bookshelf. Yeah, uh, that's about it. Thank you so much for listening and thank you for support. Let me know what you think. Um, leave me a positive review if you, if you want to help me in any shape or form. Give me a follow, subscribe on YouTube. Uh, give me a positive re review on any podcast platform, please. If there are any ethical Bitcoin sponsor, any ethical sponsors out there who want to sp uh, sponsor me, especially Bitcoin sponsors, please get in touch with me. Uh, write me uh, to hello at the totalconnector.com or kd at kvandabani.com. Uh, thanks again so much for your support, for listening, and for making uh, this ev monetary evolution a reality. We can only do this together. All right, that's about it. Thank you so much again, and I'll see you soon. Bye.